Jesus' name. Amen. It's Christmas time, and I am I'm so thankful for that, and especially over the next month when there's this heightened sense of uh, an inward focus, when there's this heightened sense of consumerism, we will all hopefully have a heightened awareness of how amazing Jesus is. Personally, I think that it's always a good time to focus on Jesus. I think that Jesus should be the reason for every season. It's not that I don't like this idea that Jesus is the reason for the season, that he's the reason for the Christmas season, because certainly he is. But when Christmas is over and January comes around, he's the reason for that season too, right? And he's the reason for, for all the seasons. But certainly during this season when we're celebrating his birth, when we're celebrating the sacrifice that Jesus made to, to leave heaven and to come to earth for us, the, the very least that we can do is keep Jesus at the center focus of this holiday season. Today I want to talk about amazing Jesus. I want to talk about amazing Jesus. And even though Jesus is amazing and we should talk about how amazing he is and we should talk about it all the time today's message isn't so much about how uh, amazing Jesus is but it's about how we honor and worship God in a manner that amazes Jesus we're today we're going to talk about the act of amazing Jesus I want to amaze Jesus many times uh, through the Gospels, people looked on at the ministry and the life of Jesus, and it says that the people looked at him and they were amazed, right? I mean, the things that he was doing were amazing to the people. But only two times in all of Scripture do we find that someone did something that amazed Jesus, that caused Jesus to look at them and to marvel. And I want to look at those two times in Scripture today and see if we can find out how to live lives that are amazing to Jesus. Are you following me this morning? All right, let's look at it. Mark 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Mark 6, 1 through 7. Jesus left there, went to his hometown, accompanied by his Disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed, right? This happened all the time. The people would hear him, they would see him, hear his uh, teaching, see his miracles, and they would be amazed. And they said, where did this man get these things, they asked. What's the wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? And then in verse 3, the tone of what they're saying in their conversation changes, and they say, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town among his relatives and in his own home. And he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Verse number six, here's what it says. He, that's Jesus, he was amazed at what? Their lack of faith. He was amazed. He marveled at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. So by this time, by uh, Mark chapter number 6, what we just read, by this time, Jesus is already traveling. Uh, we see that he's traveling with all 12 of his disciples, so he's gathered all of them around him. He's traveling. His ministry is in full swing. Word of his teachings and his miracles have spread everywhere. And Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, and we don't know a lot about Nazareth. We know that it was a very, very small uh, village. We know that uh, there wasn't a lot of respect, right? for the city of Nazareth. The only time that people really talked about Nazareth was to say bad things about Nazareth. You know, is there anything good that can come out of Nazareth? That was mentioned of Jesus' hometown. So Jesus goes back to uh, Nazareth to minister there. And we're going to talk about uh, why this is true later, but we see in verse number 6 that Jesus is amazed at the people, at his hometown people, at their lack of 
faith, right? He's amazed at their lack of faith. Now let's look at the other time in Scripture where Jesus was amazed. We find it in Luke 7, verses 1 through 10. When Jesus has, had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There was a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly. He was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our Synagogue, Verse number six. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servants, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent, returned to the house, and they found the servant well. So verse number 9 says that Jesus was amazed at him, and then he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. It's not the focus of our message today, but it's interesting to me that the very people who should have welcomed Jesus were the ones who rejected him. The very people that should have welcomed him and, and honored him and respected him. His, his own people, his own family are the ones who rejected him. His own people eventually would be the ones who crucified him. And a centurion was a, a Roman soldier who was over other Roman soldiers. And the, the Roman would have been uh, among the least to have given honor and respect to uh, a Jewish Messiah, and he was the one who led the way with this amazing faith. Just let it be a lesson to us that no matter uh, who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what your past is, it's not about scripture knowledge, it's not about doctrinal understanding, or it's not about spiritual heritage, it's not about ministry training that we have. Jesus is interested in one thing, and that is our faith being placed in him. Hebrews 11 and verse number 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And that's true, and we see that reflected in these two scenes that we've just looked at in Scripture this morning, where Jesus was amazed. One time, he was amazed at what? A lack of faith. And then another time, he was amazed at abundant faith. And there's a lot to this idea that Jesus was amazed by Faith. If we want to amaze Jesus, it's going to come through lives of faith. But what I really want to talk about today is the root that bears the fruit of faith in God, and that is honor. And we see this proven out in both of our stories today, the importance of honor. First, we see a, a lack of faith. From his own people in his hometown, we see a lack of faith, but that lack of faith comes from a lack of honor for the authority of Jesus. So let's go back through the verses and just think about uh, what his people said to him and what they said about him. Jesus goes back to his hometown. They hear him speak. They hear him speaking with authority. They hear of his Miracles, they hear his teaching, but they can't get over the fact that this was the carpenter kid who used to run around with their kids in the streets. They could not see who Jesus was because they were so focused on who he had been. Just a side note, some of you right now, you're trying to change your lives, you're trying to start following Jesus, and to accomplish that, you're probably going to have to start doing Life with people who see Jesus in your future and not the demons in your past. It means you're probably going to have to lose some old friends and find some new brothers and sisters in Christ 
to walk with because some people only want to see the old you because it makes them feel better that they're still the old them. Y'all with me this morning? When we start following Jesus, and you, when you start that process, you become a new you, and that new you means that there can be a new them that they don't want to change into. So when you're around them, it's convicting to their spirit. The Holy Spirit inside of you starts to convict the spirit inside of them. They'll try to tell you who you used to be to justify who they still are. you got to get away from people like that. He goes back, and all they remember is that this, this is Jesus, right? Isn't this, isn't this little Jesus who used to run around with Fred late at night, and they were a little bit rowdy sometimes. This is just, is it, isn't, this the, isn't this the carpenter? He, this is the guy who made me that table? That table wobbles a little bit now. Like, I don't, know, I don't know about this guy. And his own people dishonored him. When they said, isn't this the carpenter, what they were actually saying is, this guy's no preacher. He's just a carpenter. He's no prophet. He's no evangelist. He's no spiritual leader. What were they actually doing? This is important. They were questioning Jesus' spiritual authority, and they were questioning his positional authority as well. And they were saying, this guy's nothing special. He's talking with all of this authority. He's acting like he's better than we are. But really, we know who this guy is. He's really just the carpenter. Then they say, not only do they say, isn't this just the carpenter? They say, isn't this Mary's son? To us, that may not mean much, but in their culture, culture, this was so disrespectful. Isn't this Mary's son? Because in their culture, you would never say, this is the son of Mary. You would always say, this is the son of Joseph. You would name the father. It was a patriarchal, it was a lineage, lineage, honoring society that they were in and they respect was given because of and through the father's name and so they should have said isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph and instead they said isn't this Jesus the son of Mary now why would they have done that here's what you have to understand and we touched on this earlier but it's really important to understanding this is that Nazareth was a very small town and I grew up in a really small town and so I understand uh, I understand small towns and here's what I know about small towns in in small towns people talk a lot y'all didn't grow up in small towns in small towns people talk a lot and their memories are long that's what's happening here they're calling Jesus son of Mary because they remember how Jesus was born they remember that Mary had a baby before she had a husband they remember not really believing the whole God got me pregnant story. If you think everybody, y'all are acting like y'all would have just bought that. Like somebody shows up to church and they're six months pregnant and uh, they're not married and they're, they're engaged and they're like, no, no, but you know, it wasn't us. An angel visited me and the Holy Spirit actually came on me and uh, I'm, I'm pregnant with God's child and we're all like, okay. They remember not really buying in to the whole God got me pregnant thing. And so what they're actually saying is we know that Mary is the mother, but we really don't know who the father is. The son of, not Joseph, but the son of Mary. And they name some of Jesus' brothers here, too. They're questioning his social authority. You have to remember at this point, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe that he was the Messiah. So they're saying if his own brothers, if the people who are biologically predisposed to love him and to believe in him, if they don't even believe that he's the Messiah, then why should we? And, and Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. He says he could only heal a few people there. Why? Because only a few people had enough faith in him to allow him to work. They saw the signs, they heard the teaching, but they lacked faith. Why? Because they lacked honor for who Jesus was. And then we see this amazing faith from the centurion, from the Roman centurion. And really it comes out of a place of, a spirit of honor. 
in contrast to the pride that Jesus encountered in Nazareth, we immediately see the humility of this Roman centurion. He said, I'm not even worthy. He said, this is why I didn't come to you. I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. I'm certainly not worthy to have you come into my house. He respected and honored the ministry of Jesus. He also honored the authority of Jesus. He said, I'm a man who has authority. I'm a man who's under authority, and I know that you have authority over all things here on earth. First of all, it needs to be said that you can't be a person of spiritual authority if you can't be a person under spiritual authority. Jesus was amazed at his faith. He said he hadn't even seen faith like that among the people of Israel, and he healed the centurion's servant because of his faith in the authority of Jesus that was expressed by the way that he honored Jesus. In both cases, faith was the product of honor for the authority of Jesus. And that's actually where I want to spend the rest of our time today. I think it's easy to preach a message like this and say that we should honor Jesus and that we should have faith in Jesus and just leave it in this really abstract place and then say, okay, just go do that. Just go honor Jesus this week. Just, just go have some more faith in Jesus. And uh, I think that we, as, as pastors, when I say we, I mean as pastors and as teachers, I think that we shortchange our people when we don't give them some, some, some specific ways that they can go and show honor to Jesus. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about it uh, in, in biblical terms this morning. First, I want to say that faith is expressed in a lot of real world ways. So I'm not saying that the only way that we express our faith in Jesus is uh, by giving and showing biblical honor. But I do think that it's really important that in both of these stories where Jesus was amazed at faith or the lack of faith, there was a direct correlation with honor in those things. And I also think that honor in our culture and in our society is really important for us to talk about because as a culture, we do not honor well. There's a lack of honor for government, there's a lack of honor for teachers, there's a lack of honor for police officers, there's a lack of honor for parents, there's a, a lack of honor for authority that's given to us in, gener in general. And what I want to help us see is that giving honor in all these, cat these four categories that we're going to talk about today, giving honor to people who are placed in authority over our lives is really actually giving honor to God. The reason that this is true is because God is in control of all. Everybody say, oh, oh. okay, I'm glad you knew what I was trying to get out there. <clears throat> Let's try again. Everybody say, oh. all. God is in control of all of the leadership that has been placed over us here on earth earth pastor i don't know if i believe that because there are some pretty bad leaders okay let's read about it romans 13 let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which god has established there is no authority except that which god has established the authorities that exist have been established by god verse 2 consequently Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. If you go down to verse 7 in Romans 13, it says, Give to everyone what you owe them. And it's still talking about authority here. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. I almost want to step out from behind the Word of God for just a second. I'm not going to because I, I still got, we got a lot of stuff I want to talk about this morning. But this is good. If you owe taxes, it's dishonoring to God to cheat on your taxes. Okay, back, that, that was not popular. I got to tell you, I don't like paying taxes. Right? I don't, it's not something that just gives me a lot of joy. Whenever I write that check, it, it's, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't find a lot of pleasure in it but it's authority that God has placed over my life and whether I agree with it or I disagree with it and by the way I'll tell you that mostly I disagree with it but no matter how I feel about it the Bible says give to everyone what you owe them if you owe taxes pay taxes okay let's move on if revenue 
if you owe revenue, then pay revenue. If you owe someone something, you should pay it back to them. Then we move out of the financial, and it says if you owe respect to someone, then pay them the respect that you owe them. And then finally, Romans 13, the last thing in verse number 7, says if you owe honor to someone, then honor them. Then pay them honor. I want to talk about four types of leadership that we should honor Not because we always agree with their leadership or agree with what they do or all their decisions, but four types of leadership that we should honor because of our faith in God. The first first kind is this. We should honor our civil leadership. 1 Peter chapter number 2, starting in verse number 13, says, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to command those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not, let, do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. This is important. Verse number 17. Show proper respect to Everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and what? Honor the emperor. Verse number 17 starts out so great. It starts out so smooth. There will be nothing to complain about until the very end of verse number 17. It says, respect people. Okay, I can do that. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. I can do that. Fear God. I can do that. And in the same list of those things, Peter says, oh yeah, oh also, honor the emperor. And there we kind of have a problem. We like to honor our civil leaders as long as we agree with them. As long as we voted for them, then we'll give them honor. Ooh, it's so quiet. This must be good. As long as we're on the same side of the aisle as they are, then we'll give them honor. But Peter isn't just telling us to honor civil leadership when we like them or when we agree with them or when we voted for them or we think the same way as they think he said honor the emperor and that was serious because the jews were still under roman control the emperor was roman the romans were oppressing the jews and had for generations the emperor during this time the first century about 64 to 66 a.d somewhere in there is when this letter was written The emperor during this time was Nero. He placed King Agrippa over this region in Israel. And so the emperor is Nero, and then the king is Agrippa. And those are the people who Peter is saying to honor. That may not mean anything to you, uh, but both of these guys, Nero and Agrippa, they were bad dudes. Not just a little bit bad. Like we talked about cheating on our taxes before. Like not just a little bit of immorality. They were very, very bad men. Uh, who mostly hated Christians and uh, killed them for sport. Nero is known for literally taking Christians and throwing them to the lions in coliseums filled with Romans, and they would cheer on as the lions devoured the Christians in front of them. These were, and Agrippa somehow was probably worse than Nero was. Like, he was a bad, bad guy. And Peter says what? Are y'all following me? You don't know what he says? Because we read it a couple times. He said, honor the emperor. Honor Nero. Hmm. Here's what we have to really internalize if we're going to be able to do this. Because what Peter is saying to do is to honor someone who is not honorable. Right? So here's what we're going to have to internalize if we're going to be able to do this. We are not honoring the person because that person is worthy of honor. We're honoring them because of our faith, it, because our faith is in God and it's not in man. And God placed that authority over us, so we have to have enough faith in God to honor that authority. That means that the president should be honored. When the president is red, he should be honored. When the president is blue, he should be honored. 
When you agree with him, he should be honored. And when you disagree with him, he should be honored. Local government authorities should be honored. If you voted for them or if you voted for the other guy, it really doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to the honor that they're due in the structure that God has placed over our lives. Police officers should be honored. If the Roman emperor in the first century should be honored by all followers of Jesus, then certainly all civil authority should be honored. I think Peter gave us that, like just the most extreme example, because the, really the Holy Spirit gave it to us because he knew us and he knew that we'd need it. He knew that we would read, you should honor all civil authority, and we would think, yeah, but Peter really didn't know about, uh, Peter really didn't know about Trump and how terrible he was. Peter really didn't know about Biden and all the awful things that he's done. And, and what Peter does is he just blows that out of the water. And he says, you should honor the emperor. When he kills your friends for being believers, you still owe him honor. Whew. Okay, we got to move on this is just because of time. But by the silence in the room, we're probably going to circle back to that again at some point. We should honor our civil leadership. The second thing is that we should honor family leadership. Colossians 3, verse 18 says, Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Verse 21 says, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Parents, you should honor your children. All the kids in the room said amen. Parents, you should honor your children. How do I do that? How do I honor my children? I honor my children by raising them in the Lord. Parents, we raise children. Not the other way around. Mm. Man, there's a lot of good stuff in here. I hear people say, well, I don't, want to force my, I don't want to force my kids to go to church. I don't want to force Jesus on them because I, I want them to love the Lord. And I don't, if, if, I force, if I force them to go to church and if I force Jesus on them, then they're just going to resent that and they're just going to resent me and they're just going to run away from Jesus. Nonsense. Amen. Absolute nonsense. You are the parent. They are the child. You force your kids to do all kinds of stuff they don't want to do. I make my sons brush their teeth every single day. They don't get to come to me and say, Dad, I'm going to resent brushing my teeth when I get older. No, you're going to be thankful that you have teeth when you get older. <laughs> I force my kids to go to school even when they don't want to go to school. When they're sick, guess what? I force them to go to the doctor. They don't have a say in it because they're a little bit afraid of the doctor. If it's time to go to the doctor, we're going to go to the doctor. I make my kids do all kinds of stuff they don't want to do. Do you know why? Because I'm the parent and they're the kid. You don't want to do what I want you to do? That's fine. Get a job and move on. It's, on, it's dishonoring to our kids to allow them to raise themselves. We honor our children by raising them in the Lord. Children, we should honor our parents. Whenever we're living at home, we honor them in a different way than when we're not living at home anymore, but always we should honor them. When we're living at home, we honor them with obedience. When we're grown and we don't live at home anymore, we honor them with healthy, respectful boundaries. But in all of our life, as long as we have parents, it is our job to honor our parents. The first command with a promise, honor your father and mother. You'll live a long life. I know, again, I know that not all parents are the best parents, but there's just nothing in the Bible that says dishonoring bad parents is okay. We should honor the family authority that God has placed in our lives. Husbands, get ready, wives. I'm going to tee it up for you. Husbands, you should honor your wives. Husbands, we honor our wives with love. 
We honor our wives with devotion, with fidelity, with integrity. We honor our wives by not watching those videos that pop up on our phone. We honor our wives by not looking lustfully at other women who have not paid the price to bear our children. Come on, women. We honor our wives by being faithful to them. Okay, wives, it's your turn, husbands, get ready. Wives should honor their husbands. Wives, the husband honors you with love. Did I say that right? Yes, I did. You should honor your husband with respect, with humility, with integrity. You honor your husband by not talking down about him when it's just you and your girlfriends in a conversation. You honor him by not publicly tearing him down, but always building him up. God has established familiar, familiar structure of honor, and we should follow it. The third category I want to talk about is social leadership. Colossians 3, if you just continue uh, in that same set of scriptures that we were reading from just a moment ago, uh, the writer goes on to say, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. What is social leadership? This is our, our bosses at work. This is the umpire at the baseball game. This is the manager at the store. Even when your boss is a jerk. None of y'all have bad bosses. Even when the umpire is blind, and I've seen a bunch of them. Even when the manager is rude to you. This text talks about slaves obeying their masters. And you have to ask the question, so is this theological foundation for slavery? And certainly it's not. But it is a theological foundation for honoring all leadership, no matter the position that you're in. No matter how they treat you. No matter if it's fair or if it's unfair, you honor authority. Why? Because it's a way that you show honor to God. This is a tough one for me. But it's what the scripture says. Because i got to tell you, if, if we circle back to the umpire thing, I've yelled at a few umpires before. I've done so much better since I've been here as your pastor because Danica reminded me after we came here, uh, hey, you're the pastor. <laughs> but when it's just me and my family at home and we're watching the game, I'll holler and scream and yell and I try to compose myself better whenever I'm in public, just, you know, for you guys. But <laughs> it really is true that when we honor social authority that has been placed in front of us, over us, when we honor social authority, whether they are right or whether they're wrong, whether they're worthy of honor or not, when we give them honor, what we're actually doing is honoring God because we understand that God has placed all authority in our lives number four spiritual leadership we should honor civil leadership definitely we should honor social leadership we should honor familial leadership and we should also honor spiritual leadership first timothy five seventeen says the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. As far as I can tell, this is the only place in all of Scripture where double honor is mentioned. It's the same principle, this same idea, the same principle that uh, is being written about here from Paul to Timothy. Is It applies to all of our staff as well. Um, and I have spiritual 
authority, who I am to honor as well. It's just a category of leadership that we have as believers. And I know a lot of people have taken this idea of honoring spiritual authority, and they've taken it to a, a bad place. I know pastors who make their staff and their people read books about how they want to be honored. And it just leads to this really weird and unbiblical place that goes way too far beyond honor. You want to know how you can honor all the categories that we've talked about, but specifically, do you want to know how you can honor your spiritual authority? I'll, I'll give you uh, seven ways that you can honor your spiritual authority just really quick. Number one, pray for your pastors. You want to honor your pastors and your spiritual, the spiritual authority in your life? Pray for them. Number two, be planted where you are and work with your pastors. Don't be flip-flopping, hopping all over the place all the time. Get to a place, be planted there where you are, stand with your pastors and say, I'm going to be here with you building this thing for the kingdom of God. That is honoring to the spiritual authority that God has placed in your life. Number three, walk in unity and protect the unity of the church. Number four, get involved with serving, get involved and serve with the gifts that God has given you. It honors your spiritual leadership and your spiritual authority. Number five, just love your pastors. It honors them. Number six, defend your pastors publicly. Defend the church. Have something good to say. If you can't come up with anything good to say about your church, you should probably find a different church. If you can't come up with anything good that your church is doing, anything good to say, when you hear people, not maybe not just specifically running down your church, but when you hear them talking bad about the church, if you can't think of anything good to say about the church, go find a church that's doing something good. Become a part of that, a church that you can say something good about. But defend your church, defend your pastor, defend what God is doing in and through Wellspring Church in public. I have an awesome story about this, and I don't know if I've ever shared this uh, before, but I had just been here for less than a year, probably about nine or uh, ten months, something like that, and my parents came down for a visit, and we went to a Gosnell uh, home football game, and I uh, walked in, and I saw Heath uh, selling some stuff for the booster club, I guess, right inside the gates, but Heath didn't see me, and Heath didn't know who my dad was, and I said, hey, we're going to mess with that guy right over there. So I hid behind the column, and I said, hey, I want you, you see that guy right over there? He's selling that stuff. He's like, yeah. I said, I want you to go up to him, and I want you to tell him that you heard that his new pastor was a sorry sucker and that nobody should go to that church and I mean and just like talk about how bad I am and I just want to see what he does and yes that's taking a risk <laughs> <laughs> I understand that and so my dad who my dad's pastored my whole life uh, he you know he got a kick out of it and so I hid over behind the corner, and Dad walks up to him, and I kind of peek my head around, and Heath just looks like so uncomfortable, like I've never seen him look this uncomfortable before, and uh, walked up later and found out that's what Dad did. Dad walked up to him, and he was like, hey, man, I heard y'all got a new pastor, and I heard, that he's, I heard that he's sorry. And Heath was like, no, actually, he's pretty great. Well, I got to tell you, like in the moment when somebody's just there and they pop up out of nowhere and they say, hey, your pastor, he, he's a sorry guy. And I, it'd be kind of easy to be like, well, you know, things could be better, but it's all right. And that's not what he did at all. He was like, no, that's actually not true. Things at church are going really good. And we really like our we really like our pastor. And I got up there and I, w I was so proud that it went that way. Uh, <laughs> but what did he do? It was so simple. But it was so honoring. He just defended us. He defended uh, the church that he belonged to. And number seven uh, has to be said, financially support your pastors. And our church does that incredibly well. Not everyone uh, is so blessed uh, as we are in that, in that category. And, uh, and we are, and we're very thankful for that. i got to say, when you're talking about spiritual authority, Maybe you've been hurt by the church. Maybe you've been hurt by uh, spiritual authority. 
in your past. And I would ask you not to abandon your heart for honoring spiritual authority just because someone has misused that authority in your past. First, I'm sorry that that happened to you. I'm sorry that you were uh, hurt in whatever way that you were hurt. As long as there are people who have authority, there are people who are going to misuse it, and that goes for outside the church, and it goes for inside the church. And so I'm sorry for whatever hurt that there was for you. But I would ask, uh, don't let them steal you worshiping God. Don't let them steal you honoring God by worship, or by not by worshiping, but by honoring your spiritual authority. Here's the last thing about all of this honor, about civil and, and family and social and, and spiritual leadership, about all this honor that we're supposed to be given. Here's the last thing, and sometimes people will be trying to honor and they'll just take it too far. Uh, to the extreme, and so I want to I want to caution you uh, to certainly be honoring, and you can be extremely, you can be very honoring, but don't worship what God only meant for you to honor. People have gotten in a really bad place with spiritual authority because they have worshipped a person instead of worshiping God by honoring the person. People have gotten sucked into worshiping political figures and parties when they were only meant to honor those things. People have started worshiping their kids, and you think, worshiping our kids? How do we worship our kids? It happens all the time. Not with a shrine to your kid in the living room that you bow down to every day, but when your kids take the primary spot on the throne of your heart, then you begin to worship them and not God. Not by worshiping your kids or worshiping your parents or worshiping your spouse. We honor all authority, but all of our worship belongs to God. I want to amaze Jesus with my faith. I want to amaze him with the way that I honor all of the leadership and all of the authority in my life. It's not my faith in the people, but my faith in God that allows me to honor the leaders that God has placed over me and it's for a purpose it's attractive to people because we live in a culture we live in a society that does honor so poorly that when you honor people and things that you disagree with when you honor people and things that are sometimes dishonorable people when you give them proper honor anyway it will it will somebody will look at you and say well that's not what everybody else is doing i I know how they think and i know that they don't agree with them but they're still giving them honor it's attractive and then you can say well the reason that i'm doing that is because god has placed this authority over my life and i worship god before anything else it's attractive to the kingdom of god when we give honor where honor is due Will you guys stand with me this morning?